heard you say that we can prove that there is phenomenon out there. I was wondering if you meant paranormal phenomenon or not. Uh, I prefer not to define it as paranormal or normal. Things can be paranormal for a while. Once we have a solid explanation for them, they become quite normal, even if they're unusual. Uh, they, I, I think that they are, there are phenomena that we can't quite define within the respects of, the sci of, of traditional science as it's done right now. And I can give you a number of examples of that. But the audio is kind of just not working. Please don't worry. Uh, but, um, and you said that ghost hunting is, is unnecessary because you will never prove the existence of ghosts by something that you find in the past. And that is, that's true. You know, if you know, that, that's, that's empirical data, that's anecdotal. And you could, no matter what you do, it's anecdotal. And that's all you're going to ever have is anecdotal. Fourteen people saw this same, this same thing and they all agreed that that's what they saw. And that's a nice anecdote. But that doesn't give you proof. That doesn't get you anywhere except for one very important detail. It tells you where to go in the laboratory, where you're going to get hard data. If you simply say, well, there's probably some natural explanation and dismiss it at that, then you're not, you're not ever going to get anywhere with it. It's unless you can explain that particular case. Now, I can cite you those, I can cite you pointing cases where there are explanations the most notable and important one right now is Big Tandy. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, which is a very impressive case where there is a natural explanation. It was not really suspected by very many people, although several of us have been interested in that area for a while. Uh, but there are others where there aren't any explanations sitting there at the moment. We can look at what happens in these circumstances and we can bring it into the laboratory. And after I give somebody else a chance to talk, because I can easily sit here and talk for a full man hour on this, and we can not take a breath, I'll give somebody else a chance and we'll get back to some of that. All right? Now, we already have the first person to raise their hand. All right, let's see here. How do you pronounce your name? Helga. Helga. The last time I met was blonde, but it didn't look like you. <laughs> well, stand up here. Father comes from Salt Lake City. We've come a long way here, and you have a question for them. What is the question? Uh, actually, I'm kind of concerned that what I'm observing here is a sort of slipperiness in the definition of what we're talking about. Um, you are familiar with the original definition of science and the natural philosophy idea of science. Right? Everything that you can observe has a natural explanation, not one that has to depend on supernatural explanations, yeah. God, or whatever. Are we talking about that, or are we saying we are actually talking about some completely naturalistic explanation of weird phenomena? Go ahead. Who would like to jump in first? Michael? Well, therein lies, I guess, the rub, right? Uh, I mean, if we're, if we're only talking about searching for natural explanations, then, uh, then let's, by all means, go searching. And, uh, but at some point, you, you in a research program, you do have to produce some results, so if we could pick another example uh, that's slightly more mainstream would be a, like string theory, for example. Uh, these guys have had about 30 years of, of fairly good support from the scientific community and have produced nothing in the way of experimental results. They've got really cool mathematics and theory. String, string theory, yes. I should prefer and, theory. And, and, uh, and so anyway, now there's been a couple of critical books saying, hey, you guys, you know, at some point you've got to produce some evidence or else, you know, let's put the finding to some other research program. Okay, whether that's correct or not, uh, that is how science works. And so anecdotes are fine is a good place to start, as you said. Uh, and But, gee, I think we've had like a hundred years now of fairly rigorous, not the talk show guys that talk to the dead, um, by the way, anybody can talk to the dad. It's getting the dad to talk back. You know, that's, that's really uh, but like the but like the Ryan Institute. Okay, so by now we should have some pretty consistent results that look like or like the cold fusion that just goes away and we investigate other things. But in my opinion, we're long past that time for things like ghosts and Loch Ness and whatnot. Uh, you know, there's been enough time now that skepticism seems like a reasonable position until the null hypothesis has been overturned with some really solid evidence. It seems to me the most important question is what are you searching for? Are you searching for natural explanations of phenomena or 
supernatural explanations of phenomena. What are you actually searching for? Well, you're, of course you're searching for the natural explanation, like, like has been said already this evening. Uh, everything has an explanation, I believe. Everything can be explained. Just because it's unexplained does not mean it's unexplainable. Okay? There's a current uh, level of scientific understanding that we're at, and in the case of supernatural phenomena, Maybe we're, not, we're just not quite there yet with science, okay? Paranormal phenomena, by definition, does not perform on command. This is one of the problems with establishing, establishing this from a scientific perspective. The scientific model, for their very good purposes, for very good reasons, demands repeatability under controlled observations. And this phenomena does not perform on command, by definition. It is a chaotic uh, event that we're, we're trying to document, and therein is the rub. So you're basically saying the scientific method itself is flawed. No, I'm not saying the scientific method is flawed. The scientific method is not flawed. The, we have a difficult time establishing this from a scientific perspective because it lacks the repeatability. I completely agree with the scientific model. And yes, we do not have any hard proof that ghosts exist. As a skeptic, Allison, though, don't you kind of see that as almost like a sidestep of the issue? Saying, oh, it's too chaotic, we can't reproduce it. I do agree that if ghosts did exist and were sentient creatures, they could choose whether or not they wanted to show up. And it would therefore make them incredibly difficult to study ever unless you were able to bring one into a laboratory and dissect it. However, I don't necessarily think that the evidence that has been gathered so far points to that being true. And I know that Patrick said that he goes in looking for a natural explanation. My question is, why look? If you're looking for a natural explanation, then you're going into it just as biased as you would be if you were looking for a paranormal explanation to it. You're I don't know. looking for the explanation. It doesn't matter if it's paranormal. Let me interject something, okay? In the course of paranormal research, you have to rule out the logical explanation first before you can start looking elsewhere, okay? There's, you hear rapping behind the wall, okay? The first thing I'm looking for is the loose hot water pipe that needs to be tied down, okay? So, next question here. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Winfield Moses. I understand. Winfield's local. I understand what you're saying about repeatability, but in certain fields, such as epidemiology and biostatistics, where frequency can be extremely sparse, where you can need a large number of samples for a very really small number of cases, uh, you do the studies, that, that will work on those sizes and they give you a reasonable degree of confidence in intervals and such. Um, why can't you do that with a fair amount of Because those intervals are very, very sparse. There's, there's a huge distance between them. Um, there's also not a whole lot of research money in our field. Um, That's one of the biggest problems. There's not a lot of research money. Yeah. The money, money, research money, grant money goes towards medicine, towards electronics, aerospace, areas of research that have a tangible Product at the end. However, I do want to, I do want to address for a moment this notion that parapsychology does not produce any any reproducible results and never has, because that's something that our friends here tend to throw out a lot. It's not really quite true. Uh, way back in the in the 40s, uh, J.B. Ryan and his colleagues were doing the common part flipping experiments. They did this, and the labs did this, and in many occasions. Some people can do it under some circumstances, it seems. They can call cards to, to an extent that are not explainable by chance. Uh, but in modern times, we've done a good bit more than that. Uh, there is one study showing um, an apparent uh, un unusual, let's, let's call it unusual, let's not call it paranormal, let's not call it psychic, but an unusual healing effect on anesthetized mice by people who have ta who claim talents in what they call psychic healing. Uh, this is a highly significant series of experiments. It was done many times over uh, under a number of different circumstances, very tightly controlled. Uh, it was repeated by two independent researchers uh, in, at the same laboratory. It was later repeated by some researchers in Texas. They repeated again in California using fruit flies instead of mice as the subjects. Uh, all those experiments were significant. This type of thing appears to be fairly reproducible.